Hey everyone, my name is Nikki Young and this is Serial Napper, the true crime podcast for naps. I'm back with another true crime story to lull you to sleep or perhaps to give you nightmares. It was the summer of 1995. 13-year-old Thad Phillips had fallen asleep in his living room watching a movie. Suddenly, he awoke to the feeling of someone lifting him up and carrying him away. Initially, he thought maybe it was his dad bringing him upstairs to bed, but it wasn't. The person holding him was an older teen boy named Joe Clark. Joe carried Thad outside of his home and asked him to follow him to help fix his broken down car. Still half asleep, Thad agreed, following Joe all of the way to a rundown broken home. He followed Joe into the home, not realizing that he was about to endure the most terrifying, painful 43 hours of his life. The teenage boy that Thad had thought could be a friend turned into his worst nightmare. Joe loved the sound of bones breaking. He attacked Thad, twisting and turning his ankles until his bones shattered and splintered, making it nearly impossible for the young boy to get away. After two days of being tortured, miraculously Thad was able to escape with his life. He was lucky, because as it turned out, He wasn't the only victim of Joe Clark, but he was the only one to live. This is the story of Thad Phillips, the lone survivor of the Bone Breaker Killer. So, let's jump right in. In the summer of 1995, 13-year-old Thaddeus Thad Phillips was new to the town of Baraboo, Wisconsin. He and his family had just moved into their new home, and Thad had started at a new school. They lived in a middle-class neighborhood, and they were just getting familiar with the area. He didn't really know anyone, and he was still just trying to make some new friends. On July 29, 1995, the Phillips family went out for dinner, and then they returned home to enjoy a movie in the living room. Later that evening, Thad's parents decided to head to bed, but he and his little sister stayed up to watch some TV. Thad ended up falling asleep in the living room, which I've got to say is my absolute favorite way to fall asleep. I know doctors say that it's not great for you and not conducive to a good sleep, but especially as a kid, it was always a treat to get to stay up late watching TV and then to just crash in the living room. A few hours after dozing off, Thad woke up to someone picking him up off the couch and carrying him away. He was still half asleep, and at first, he thought that it must be his father carrying him up to bed. Again, another one of my most favorite things as a kid. And truly, if I could convince my husband to pick me up and carry me to bed now, I would. As he rubbed his eyes awake and looked up at the person holding him, he realized that he did not know this person. It was an older-looking teenage boy. And he didn't recognize him, but this boy would later be revealed to be 17-year-old Joe Clark, an older kid who lived in the same neighborhood. Joe carried Thad outside of the home and then put him down on the ground. He seemed friendly enough, and he asked if Thad could follow him to his car because he was having some troubles getting it started. Thad was still half asleep and completely disoriented. He didn't really think twice about it, and he followed Joe down the street. The two boys walked about half a mile from where the Phillips lived, and then they stopped when they arrived at what looked like a run-down, derelict home. Joe kind of switched gears. He dropped the topic of this broken-down car, and he told Thad to follow him inside. He had planned to throw a party soon, and he was going to be inviting several other boys from the school. Thad even recognized some of the names of these boys, so even though he was slightly confused as to what the hell was going on, he followed him inside, figuring this would be his opportunity to meet some new people from school and to make some new friends. At this point, he wasn't fearful, but he should have been. Inside, the home was an absolute wreck. It was in shambles. Everything was dirty, there were clothes all over the place, moldy dishes, and old food. From everything that I've read, I can't quite figure out where Joe's parents were, but it's clear they were either away doing their own thing for an extended period of time, or they were just pure neglectful, probably a bit of both. Walking through this wreck of a house, Thad began to get apprehensive, but Joe maintained a friendly disposition. 
So when Joe asked him if he wanted to go up to his room to check out some of the model cars that he had collected, Thad said yes. They sat on the bed beside one another looking at these cars when suddenly Joe's eyes went dark. He pushed Thad down onto the soiled bed and he grabbed his right ankle. He began to twist the ankle against its natural position until the bones shattered and splintered. Have you ever seen those gymnastic videos where the gymnast lands on their legs the wrong way and they just snap and break? It's horrifying to watch, but Joe loved the sound of snapping bones. Thad would have been in agonizing pain, confused and shouting for him to stop. Unfortunately, Joe was much larger than Thad, but in that moment, he knew he had to try to get the hell out of there. So he jumped off the bed and he tried to get away, hobbling down the stairs with a shattered ankle. He was able to get all the way past the living room with Joe following right behind him. As he reached the kitchen, Joe grabbed him from behind and dragged him onto the couch in the living room where he continued to brutalize him. Joe looked infuriated that Thad had even attempted to escape him, and he took his anger out on Thad's right leg. He pushed the leg towards Thad's head, putting his whole weight on the leg until he heard the thigh snap. That seemed to satisfy Joe, because just as quickly as he had become enraged, he returned to a friendly disposition. It was terrifying how quickly he could change back and forth from a monster to a friend. When Joe had seemingly calmed down, Thad asked him why he was doing this to him, and Joe casually responded that he enjoyed the sound of bones breaking. It was as simple as that. Then he put on the television and they began to watch some TV. Joe chatted with Thad as if nothing had happened, and Thad thought that this could be his opportunity to get some help. He asked Joe if he could use the phone to call his parents, no doubt that they were worried about him. To his surprise, Joe said yes and handed him the phone. As Thad frantically began to dial his number, he realized there was no dial tone on the other end of the line. He looked up at Joe and saw that he was smiling and laughing. Joe had cut the phone cord. He was never going to allow Thad to get help. He just enjoyed watching him lose all hope. And then, seemingly out of nowhere, Joe became enraged once again. He picked Thad up and carried him upstairs to his room, threw him back on the bed where he now focused on his left leg. He began to twist his left ankle until it shattered, until it was facing in the wrong direction. This time, Thad tried defending himself by punching Joe in the back, but he told him if he didn't stop fighting, he'd break his back, so Thad laid there and endured the pain. At this point, the adrenaline was flowing through Thad's veins, and his only saving grace was that his body was going into shock, meaning he could hear the breaking and popping of his bones, but he couldn't feel it happen. But going into shock means that your body recognizes your life is in very serious danger and it's basically allowing you a bit of grace to help you survive what is happening to you. Now, as much as Joe enjoyed breaking bones, he also liked to fix them so that he could break them once again. Over the course of the evening, he would alternate between breaking Thad's bones and creating makeshift bandages and a sling to try to heal his injuries. He would wrap Thad's legs in bandages made of socks, and then he'd use a brace to keep the legs stable and straight. At times, he'd even try to get Thad to walk with this makeshift casting system. The pain was unbearable, but Thad refused to give Joe the satisfaction of seeing him cry. Meanwhile, Thad's parents woke up to find their son missing. This was highly unusual because they had just moved to the area. Thad wasn't particularly familiar with the neighborhood, and he hadn't really made any close friends yet. There weren't any signs that something nefarious had happened in the home, like signs of a struggle. The only thing that seemed kind of odd was that the kitchen light had been left on when they always turned it off before they went to bed. So Thad's parents got into their cars and began driving around, searching town for their son, completely unaware that he was being held in a home only half a mile away from where they lived. They tried not to panic. 
the fair was in town that weekend. Maybe their son had just gone to check it out. But they searched the fairgrounds and there was no sign of Thad. If only they had decided to go door to door to their neighbors, they may have found him. But of course, hindsight is 2020. Eventually, when they had exhausted all avenues, they filed a missing persons report with the police. The officer who took the report told them that they'd be on the lookout for him, but other than that, there wasn't much that they could do. There weren't any signs that anything criminal had happened, and he was a 13-year-old boy, so they kind of just assumed he had probably run off with some new friends and he'd eventually show up later. Back at Joe's house, Thad was lying on the bed with swollen, broken ankles and thighs. At times, Joe would move to the other parts of the house and Thad would hear Joe talking to someone, but he couldn't hear anyone answering him back. So Thad assumed that there must be a working phone located somewhere in the house and he knew he had to find it. That evening, he planned to try to escape once more. He heard Joe leave the house, get in his car, and drive away, so this was his chance. And he knew it might be his only chance. Joe had assumed that he had done enough damage to Thad's ankles and thighs, it would likely be impossible for him to get up and escape, but he was wrong. Thad flung himself off the bed, onto the floor, and then drug his body and heavy broken legs towards the staircase. He knew that he wouldn't be able to walk down the stairs because his legs were absolutely shattered and swollen beyond recognition, so he threw himself down the stairs. He hit the landing so hard that it knocked him out for a few moments. He was weak from both his injuries and from the lack of food and water that had been given to him throughout this whole ordeal. When he finally came to, he attempted to crawl through the living room and then into the kitchen where he once again passed out. Then he woke up when he heard the front door open and Joe and a girl walked in. They sat on the couch in the living room, talking, laughing, kissing, completely unaware that Thad was in the kitchen lying on the floor, silent and still. Eventually, the girl left and Joe walked into the kitchen. He was shocked to find Thad lying on the floor. He once again picked Thad up and carried him back up the stairs where he punished him for trying to escape by holding a pillow over his face. Joe punched him, kicked him, jumped on his chest, and once again twisted his ankles, compounding his older injuries. Then he carried Thad back down the stairs so that they could watch TV together, because that's completely normal. And once again, I've gotta ask, where the hell are Joe's parents this whole time? Not where they should be, keeping an eye on their sadistic son. Thad asked Joe if he had ever done this to anyone else, and he said he had, twice. One of the names he gave was some kid named Chris Steiner. Thad didn't know who Chris was, but he was shocked to hear that Joe had gotten away with it twice before. They both passed out on the couch, and I can't imagine the thoughts that must have been running through Thad's head. By the following morning, Thad had been missing for nearly two days. How long was this torture going to continue? Joe lifted him up off the couch and carried him back upstairs. He had plans to go to a party that day, so he continued to twist Thad's already mangled legs to absolutely ensure that he could not escape this time while he was away. When he was done, for good measure, he placed Thad into his closet and he locked the door. He wasn't taking any more chances of Thad escaping. Then Joe got into his car and he left. Thad had already tried and failed to escape three times. His body was failing him. It was shutting down. He had endured over 40 hours of the most horrific abuse. His legs were completely shattered. They were purple, blue, swollen, and they didn't look human anymore. His feet were twisted almost around, almost completely the opposite way. He felt like it was now or never. If he wanted to ever see his family again, this would be his last chance to escape. Thad took a look around the closet to find something that he could use to break down the door. There wasn't much in the musty, dirty closet, but he did find an old guitar. 
He grabbed it and with every ounce of energy that he had left in his body, he slammed it down on the closet door until it gave way and opened. Then Thad dragged himself out of the bedroom, over to the stairs once again, and he threw himself down, the only way he was able to get downstairs. He crawled through the living room into the kitchen where there was a corded phone on the wall. He was able to grab the phone cord and pull the receiver down, and thank God it had a dial pad on the receiver. When he called 911, the operator who answered thought that it was a joke at first just because of how calm Thad was. He told them his name and that he had been kidnapped and was being held at Joe Clark's home. The local police were familiar with Joe, surprise, surprise. They had run-ins with him in the past, so they knew exactly where to go. The police arrived at the home quickly and they found Thad lying on the kitchen floor in and out of consciousness. They were shocked to see the condition of his body. His feet were nearly completely turned around and his legs were twisted back in an unnatural position, basically twisted right out to the side. Thad was put into an ambulance and sent to the hospital. He was lucky to be alive because the doctors told him that he was just hours away from dying. Thad had been held for about 43 hours of pure torture. He sustained severe fractures to both of his legs and he needed several surgeries over the years, but it was a miracle that he didn't have further damage, though he would walk with a permanent limp. After getting out of his surgery, Thad was able to tell the police about the other two people that Joe had admitted to hurting. He couldn't remember the name of the first kid, but the second he thought was Chris S. Chris S. Chris something that started with an S. He wasn't sure of the last name, but he had remembered that it did start with an S. That kid would turn out to be 14-year-old Chris Steiner, but we'll get to him in a minute. The police would find and arrest Joe Clark while he was still at that party. He seemed completely unfazed when they showed up. And the first words out of his mouth were, oh, he's still alive? They brought Joe into the police station while they searched his home, where they found a list of 29 names on three sheets of paper under the categories of get to know, can wait, and leg thing. Clearly, he was going to be targeting more people. Thad was not going to be his last victim. He denied trying to kill Thad Phillips, instead saying that he just wanted to hang out. If Thad had sustained any injuries, well, he didn't know much about that because he had blacked out. How convenient. The police also wanted to investigate Joe's connection to Chris Steiner, a 14-year-old local teen who had been found drowned in the river. It was July 14th, 1994, about a year before Thad had been abducted. 14-year-old Chris Steiner decided to go to bed early that night because he was going to be starting a new job in the morning. His parents checked in on him at around 10 p.m., and he was soundly asleep in his bed. But when they went to wake him the following morning at around 6.15 a.m., he wasn't in his room. Unlike in Thad's case, there was some evidence of foul play in Chris's disappearance. The screen window located in the ground floor bedroom had been slashed. This was Chris's older brother's room, but he just so happened to not be home that night. It looked like someone had slashed the screen and then climbed into the home. There were muddy footprints found outside of that window and then all inside the home too. The ground floor patio doors were also discovered unlocked, but Chris's parents knew that they had locked it before they went to bed that night. Because Chris was a young teen boy, again, the initial assumption was that he had snuck out to go to a party or just to hang out with some friends, especially because it was July 4th weekend and there were a ton of celebrations happening. The police thought that he could have been another teen runaway, but Chris's parents knew that that wasn't true. He had just gotten his first job and he was really excited to start his shift that morning. Six days after he went missing, there would be a body found in the Wisconsin River draped over a tree branch. The body was bloated from being in the water so long and badly decomposed. However, dental records confirmed that it was the body of teenager Chris Steiner. What's really weird, to me at least, is that when an autopsy was conducted, they didn't find any traumatic injuries on his body. 
His cause of death was listed as a drowning, and while the police believed that there may have been foul play involved, his manner of death was listed as undetermined. Because of this, and the fact that there wasn't any clear indication that he was murdered, there wasn't an active investigation into finding the perpetrator. His parents felt like someone had killed their son. There wasn't any other reason that he would be found drowned in the river like that. When they asked around town for any information, if anyone knew anything, one name kept coming up, Joe Clark. But Joe's mother swore up and down that her son was home with her that night at that time. Without any actual evidence to connect Joe to Chris's death, they couldn't move forward. However, with this new information from Thad Phillips, the police asked Chris Steiner's parents for permission to exhume his body, and they agreed. A second autopsy was performed, and this time it was revealed that Chris's legs and ankles, they had been broken and shattered, very similar to the injuries that Thad had sustained. This is absolutely wild to me. I'm not a professional and I never claim to be. I'm just a podcaster. But is it not shocking that they didn't find these injuries during the first autopsy? It's like they didn't even try to find the cause of his death. They found him in the river. They found water in his lungs. So boom, a drowning. End of story. If they would have done a thorough examination and found these leg injuries the first time, they may have very well been able to save Thad Phillips from the torture that he had to endure. In connection to Thad, Joe Clark was charged with attempted first-degree intentional homicide, causing great bodily harm to a child, mayhem, intent to disable or disfigure, causing mental harm to a child, and child enticement. Joe pleaded no contest and not guilty due to mental disease. In court, his defense team painted him as a victim in his own right. He had been adopted as a child, but his biological mother abused drugs while she was pregnant with him. He also claimed to have suffered from a serious head injury that was sustained during a bike crash just the year prior. And we do know that studies show head injuries are much more prevalent in serial killers, which is what Joe would have been if Thad would have died. It may be a reason, but it's certainly not an excuse. Disgustingly enough, Joe Clark's adoptive mother provided yet another false alibi for him, saying that she was home that night, that they both went to bed and if he would have snuck out at any time, she would have hurt him. Well, I doubt that because he was able to abduct and hold hostage a teen boy for over 40 hours, torturing him beyond belief and she didn't have a clue because she was either right out to lunch or just not there at all. Joe Clark was found guilty and sentenced to 100 years in prison, so he would die behind bars. Although it may seem redundant, the prosecution wanted to continue with prosecuting Joe Clark with the murder of Chris Steiner. His parents deserved justice for their son too. Thad Phillips was going to testify in that trial when something awful happened to him. Just before the trial was scheduled to begin, a 15-year-old who was friends with Joe Clark and lived next door to him shot Thad with a hunting rifle. As if he hadn't endured enough, the bullet hit Thad in the rear left shoulder. It traveled up his neck and it came out his ear. He was badly injured, hospitalized for days, but lucky enough to survive another attempt on his life. Thad was able to recover and testify in the trial against Joe Clark, where he was charged with first-degree homicide, mayhem, and causing great bodily harm to a child. Again, he pleaded not guilty, but he was convicted and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for 60 years. Joe has maintained his innocence, and he even attempted to appeal his conviction, but each time he has been denied. For what he had to endure, Thad Phillips was awarded $21 million in a civil suit, but unfortunately, he hasn't seen a penny of it. To this day, he lives with great pain and he walks with a limp. There is a GoFundMe set up in his name to help for his ongoing medical bills, and I will have the link to that in my show notes just in case you're interested in donating. Now, as you may recall earlier in tonight's story, Joe Clark claimed he had two other victims prior to abducting Thad Phillips. One was identified as Chris Steiner, but to this day, the other victim has never been identified, so we don't know who he killed, 
who he hurt, we just have no idea. But it's pretty clear that if Thad had not found the strength to get away, being the lone survivor of the bone breaker killer, there would have likely been more victims. He had a list of who he was going to target next. He would have been a terrifying serial killer. And so for that, Thad is a badass and a hero. He's also survived two attempts on his life, so the universe clearly has big plans for him. I wish him nothing but the best. I survived because I wanted to be with my family. Uh, I didn't want to leave my family, and I know they wouldn't want to lose me. That's it for me tonight. If you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Napper. I also have a Serial Napper true crime discussion group over on Facebook. It's called Serial Society, and I'll have the link in my show notes. I'd love to chat with you about this case and all other cases that I cover, plus whatever is going on in true crime. You can find my audio on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. I post all of my episodes in video format over on YouTube, so go check it out. And if you're watching on YouTube, I would love if you can give me a thumbs up and subscribe. Every little bit helps. I'm over on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Serial underscore Napper, and I post things on TikTok, Serial Napper Nick, and that's all one word. Until next time, sweet dreams, stay kind, especially in the comments. Bye.